Hello. Good evening and, and welcome to the East Midlands Joint Venture with the Fire Safety Group tonight. Um, we've got a fantastic um, number of presentations, three presentations for you tonight. Uh, something for all of us to take back. But may I say really a big thank you to all in attendance tonight. We've had a fantastic response in registrations that we've had to convert from a Zoom to a webinar, which, which is great. And um, what can I say? You know, it's an important subject. It's something that we're all interested in within our own workplaces, and it's about getting things right. So hopefully this will be a big help. And, and like the, the recording earlier mentioned about CPD, don't forget it's so important that we can use this for our CPD entries. So I would like to say also a thank you to Michelle Pitkin, one of the East Midlands Committee members, who has been instrumental in making this event possible. And also a big thank you to Neil Vincer, the chair of the FIRE Group, and tonight's speakers, Michael Woods, Gary Laird and Alan Shaw. So, you know, without them, none of this would have been possible tonight. So now I'd like to hand, to, hand over to, to Neil. Neil Vincer, please, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, that was a great introduction. And certainly you're going to say a lot of things that you're probably going to hear from me as well. But I think with joint ventures, that's the sort of thing you'd expect to hear. So as chair of the Fire Risk Management Group, I would really like to welcome you all, wherever you are, because I know that many of you are across the globe as well as being in, in the UK. It's a joint event with the East Midlands branch, as you know, and it's great pleasure that we are able to bring you three presentations tonight around the subject of emergency preparedness. Feedback from other recent events has also shown that today's attendees are likely to have a wide range of knowledge and experiences. Some will be new to OSH or fire professions and will have joined us to gain some basic knowledge and others will be more experienced and will be hoping to extend or refresh their existing knowledge. I hope that the presentations will be of interest to all of you and certainly will give some variety. As Alan said, the large number of attendees registering for the event shows that there is a real interest in fire and related fire subjects, such as the ones we're gonna be talking about today. This interest is also being mirrored in the fire risk management social media links, uh, particularly in LinkedIn, where we regularly see healthy discussions amongst our 11,000 followers. Um, and just to show the interest that's occurred after those 11,000 followers have been added over the last year, which I think is, it really does demonstrate the, the importance. We're all aware that there's many fire incidents still occurring across the globe, many with severe consequences, and we all need to focus on improving our policies, processes and practices in order to reduce this number. And some of these will be things that we discussed today. With a joint event such as this, I also recognise that not all of you will be aware of what the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group is and what its aims and objectives are. So let me very briefly uh, introduce the group to you. The IOSH Fire Risk Management Group, or FRMG as you'll often see it mentioned, has itself over 11,000 members, all of which are members of IOSH. They're across the globe, and it's one of the 18 industry-specific IOSH network groups. The FRMG provides a forum for exchanging ideas and experiences across a wide selection of OSH professionals and covers the review and management of a wide range of fire-related topics. Through awareness, education, communication and other events, we aim to provide a means where OSH professionals can gain a fuller understanding of their fire-related roles and responsibilities. We also regularly discuss, review and comment on legislation, policy, guidance and recognise good practices. We also recognise that collaboration and working with similar external groups and bodies such as the Fire Sector Federation and the Institution of Fire Engineers, some of you know it as the IFE, as a means towards a common goal. 
And today, actually, you'll hear a little bit about the IFE um, from Alan Shaw in his presentation. But this also gives our members, the IOSH members, the chance to get their voices heard by a wider audience and for them to network with a wider group of similarly minded professionals with similar concerns or questions. So if you're a member of IOSH and I've whetted your appetite for more, why not consider joining the FRMG? It's free and all you need to do is contact IOSH membership and they will do the necessary for you. So that's enough from me. So I'm now actually going to start handing over to the three presenters who will, I'm sure, provide you with a very interesting and informative evening. So, Alan Shaw, would you like to start the presentations? Thank you, Neil. Good evening. This evening, our subject is emergency preparedness. Okay, tonight's speakers are Alan Shaw, that's me, and I will be talking about the IFE Far Risk Assessor Registration Scheme and Management Responsibilities. My colleague, Gary Laird, will be talking about the Far Safety Bill and Far Safety Strategy. And finally, Michael Woods, will be talking on staff responsibilities. So who am I? Uh, I'm Senior Consultant Practical Solutions Midlands Limited. My FAR portfolio is that I carry out amongst other things, FAR risk assessments for my clients. And my client base lists British Airways, Rolls-Royce jet engine production, the European Space Agency, and NBC Universal Studios. That's all about me. Now let's talk about the Institution of Fire Engineers, and it, more importantly, the Fire Risk Assessor Registration Scheme. The Institution of Fire Engineers has a membership or affiliation open to everybody worldwide, serving fire protection officers maintain a position on the national register and practicing fire risk assessors are invented, uh, invited to join us. For the register of fire risk assessors, this was an initial introduction by the IFE and it's to a national competence criteria set by the Far Risk Assessment Competency Council, FRAC, of which IFE are a member. Applicants must demonstrate their competence to a professional review panel, and applicants have to be competent with an adequate education, training, knowledge, information, and experience in the principles of fire safety and of fire risk assessment. The register of fire risk assessment gives uh, a list of approved fire risk assessors by the IFE. And you can visit our website on www.ife.org.uk. The National Register of Fire Risk Assessment, or Fire Risk Assessors, I should say, is administered by the Fire Sector Federation. And they will give you information if you email them on www.farsectorfederation.co.uk. I'd now like to hand you over to our studio because we have connectivity issues. Over to you, studio. Right, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Gary Laird. Who am I? Well, I worked in the West Yorkshire Fire Service for 35 years. Um, I have an interest in fire safety from the 1960s 
uh, 35 years in the fire service, 15 years as a health and safety senior advisor to a local authority, and now operate as a, as a training consultant. I'm a member of the Fire Risk Management Group and have been for some significant time. I'm a member of IOSH, the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, where I operate as a trainer as well, the Institute of Fire Safety Managers, and the Institute for Leadership and Management. I represent IOSH on the Fire Sector Federation. And for those who don't know, um, the Fire Sector Federation is a, a, an organization of 64 different fire related organizations who we meet two or three times a year to discuss a number of issues. The most burning issue at the moment um, and has a great deal of publicity is the Fire Safety Bill. The Fire Safety Bill was enacted on the 29th of April 2021 to amend the regulatory reform fire safety order and to clarify responsibility. The fire safety bill stipulates that for any building containing more than two sets of domestic premises, the order will apply. Now, what does this really mean? It means that now external walls, any common parts, including lobbies, stairs, landings and front doors will fall within the remit of the legislation. It also refers to external elements, doors, windows and balconies. So this is a significant piece of legislation that is on the statute book now. It will have, for those involved in fire safety and the management of premises, a significant impact. The fire safety is now an integral part of management responsibility. This is now the time for you and us to review our systems and our training practices. Along with the fire safety bill is the building safety bill, which focuses on accountability and will provide new duty holder responsibility. It will provide for an accountable person for the first time and the building safety manager. Uh, an offence, a new offence, a corporate offence, neglect, consent and connivance um, will also be on the statute books. So we need to be mindful of this. As fire safety professionals, there are a number of elements that we can look at. First of all, there is the passive control measures, which we, we see all of the time. This is permanent escape routes, normally separated by fire resisting construction. Compartmentation, which is, is really important um, to ensure that should a fire occur, that we can contain the fire into the smallest possible unit. Protected refuges with effective communication systems throughout, and more importantly, fire doors. And as they go around doing fire inspections, the quality and the integrity of doors that have been in place for some significant time is questionable. We have to prevent the spread of smoke and flames. Now, we all, I think, understand the concept of flames, but smoke and the products of smoke, the toxicity, is significantly important more now than it's ever been in the past. Fire evacuation strategy. Well, we've spoken about the legislative changes, but does your organisation have a fire safety strategy? Is the emergency preparedness and an emergency plan that is overseen? Is there a policy and procedure in the event of a fire alarm? What would normally happen in the event of the fire alarm going off? And what is the procedure in the event of a fire? My personal experience is in the event of a fire alarm, everybody sits around looking at each other in the hope that somebody will say, is that the fire alarm? By which time we've lost probably two or three minutes. Then there is an evacuation period um, where we have to take action. Procedure in the event of a fire has to be robust. It has to be robust in your organization. Active fire protection as distinct from passive fire protection involves managers, partners, duty holders, and the business continuity. Have we got these in place? Have we learned lessons from the past? If we've had a fire drill that's gone disastrously, disastrously wrong, have we learned from it? Have we put things in place? Have we embodied a number of people with responsibility to take this forward? One of the key issues that comes across to me loud and clear now 
is that where do people go for advice on fire and fire safety? Some are reluctant to involve the fire service because they will uh, come out with an enforcement head on, but there are a number of bespoke organizations of which the fire risk management group is one who can provide assistance and bespoke advice to a their members and anyone else who needs it. Don't rely on ignorance. Put simply, where are we now? Look at your organization. Where do we need to be? Have we got a system in place that will stand the test of time? How will we get there? We need to draw plans up. We might need to do tabletop exercises. When do we do them and where do we do them? Who needs to do it and what resources do they require? These are all questions I'm not going to give you the answer to. This is homework to go away with and think about in relation to your organisation. The procedures that you put in place must follow industry standards. And, you know, the fire risk management group can, can provide you with information regarding the industry standards. Have you stress tested your organisations? I attended an IOSH seminar two years ago um, relating to Alton Towers and, and it was the, the accident that occurred on the Smiler ride. The person who was the principal health and safety advisor spoke at great lengths as to uh, they wished they had stress tested their organisation prior to the accident occurring. They just wished they hadn't taken everything as read and that everything was in place because when the accident occurred and the investigation took place that's when they found where the holes were. Regarding fire safety we need to have a competent person who is primarily responsible for the fire risk assessment and for overseeing fire safety in your premises. The responsible person will be the person who has day-to-day -day control but they must delegate to a competent person somebody who has experience qualifications and skills relating to fire. When I examine um, fire risk assess assessors uh, examinations, the two areas that they tend to fall down on on the competent person level, one is that the competent person does not have an underpinning knowledge of fire safety and the second one is they don't have an underpinning knowledge of the law as it applies. I've related the, the relevant person because this is the one that is usually missed. The relevant person, we talk about who is likely to be in the building. That is not only employees, but visitors, guests, people who ha may have special needs. Have we incorporated all these into our effective fire safety strategy? Have we got a strategy? If we haven't, then we need to be looking at one now. A generic emergency plan. And again, I'm hoping that a lot of people today, this evening, will understand, yes, we've got these in place. If you haven't, then have a look at it. Have we got a site-specific emergency evacuation plan? Do people know where the assembly point is? Do they know who will be required to find out who is still in the building? Have we got an emerg personal emergency escape plan as agreed with staff and are they aware of it? Do we have an emergency grab back? Keep it simple. We need contact numbers and names, a simple site plan and drawing, which will be very important to the fire service when they arrive. Where are the essential utilities shutoff points? The gas, the electric. We need to know where are the hydrants? Where are the dry risers? Are they on site? Are they off site? Uh, Kosh, Dazir, have we got a list of where the, they are stored? You might have radiation substances in the building. Have they been incorporated into your emergency grab bag? Do you have an emergency business continuity plan? When I ask people in my line of work, you know, can I have a look at your emergency business continuity plan? It usually consists of a very, very small document. This needs to be reviewed, certainly on a regular basis, and you need to have a champion who is at management level who can oversee the emergency plan and the business continuity plan. Because what people tend to look at is relating to fire and floods, and there are a whole range of other issues that need to be part of your emergency business continuity plan. Does the person 
at management level who is your champion, do they have an understanding and underpinning knowledge of what we're trying to achieve here? You know, do they need skills? Due diligence is a word that is banded around. Um, and from a fire safety point of view, it would probably be your only defense in the event of a criminal or civil prosecution. And what due diligence really means is that you have done all that was reasonable in the circumstances to provide a fire safety defense. When I have somebody come into the house to do electrical work or plumbing work, I normally rely on their qualification and certification. I have to say, when I go around buildings and I see people who are putting fire safety measures into premises, we just tend to employ anybody. Um, we need to make sure that they have the correct qualifications. So active fire protection, automatic fire detection, have we got an intelligent system? Is it addressable? Is it up to date? So many fire alarms I come across are obsolete. So we need to have a look at that and find out, you know, where we are with that. Manual call points, does staff know what they are? The amount of times people tell me that if I press the break glass fire alarm point, the sprinklers will go off. So we need to clarify exactly what we're talking about. Manual call points should be um, strategically placed on exit routes, stair landings, and final exit points, and should be tested on a weekly basis from a different point each time. Active fire protection, automatic fire suppression systems. As a fire professional, it disappoints me greatly that we have not taken advantage um, of sprinkler systems in the, in the widest sense. I work primarily in the education sector at the moment, and we are still on a battle to incorporate automatic fire suppression systems in new builds. To a certain extent, I can understand with retrofit, but on new builds, we're taught, you know, we have probably 8% of, the, of the, the premises covered with a suppression system. Uh, smoke control systems, depending on the nature of your premises, if it's an atrium, you may well need to consider a smoke control system. Again, it needs to be maintained, tested, and people need to know what it is because they can routinely disarm your smoke control system if they don't know what it's for. Portable firefighting equipment, we've all seen fire extinguishers all around the premises that we occupy. The question I would pose to you tonight is have we got a core of people who have actually been formally trained to use that equipment? Because if we haven't, we need to have people as a, as a fire team who can operate that equipment. There are a range of fire extinguishers and I'm teaching you to suck eggs here, but we need to have these in place um, and people competent enough to use them. I say the word competent because as part of the competency, we need to ensure that they don't put themselves in danger in an effort to try and subdue a fire. Don't forget fire blankets in the kitchen areas or elsewhere. What lessons have we learned? Well, from a fire safety point of view, it's usually relied on stable door legislation. When I joined the fire service, we relied on the Offices, Shops and Railway Premises Act. Then there was the Factories Act. Then we came on to um, the, the Workplace Regulations, the Fire Precautions Act, the Regulatory Reform Order. Um, they've usually come as, a, as a, an, an outturning from a, a disaster. We're here to build a safer future. And the object of the Fire Safety Bill and the fire, fire and the building safety bill is to ensure that we collectively have a safe future. Do we see poorly installed fire protection? The answer is yes, I do all of the time. And it's worth your while just walking around, looking at it and just checking your compliance log to see who installed it? What were their qualifications? Is this just being somebody who gave a good price? This is more and more important now as we focus on accountability and the accountable person, whoever they are, will be responsible for this particular aspect of fire safety. Um, using the building safety manager and using the words of Dame of the uh, name escapes me, uh, the golden thread throughout. 
Um, so we need to ensure that the person who's employed as the building safety manager has this thread throughout the fire safety and the building safety aspect. Last thing I'm going to look at a good quality fire risk assessment is essential to a fire strategy. And I read some horror stories when I come across fire risk assessments. People who really haven't got the competence to carry out a fire risk assessment. And it's just a quick three page exercise with a series of tick boxes. That is not what we want. We want a good quality risk assessment that will stand scrutiny and be interrogated by the fire authority. What are the pro problem areas? These are just some of the headings where fire authorities routinely prosecute. Lack of fire precautions in the building per se. So that's the first thing. Firefighting equipment, either obsolete, out of date, or hasn't been tested, or we haven't got suitable people to use it. Automatic detection. How long has your detection system been in place? Is it an obsolete system? I've come across a few very recently. Just have a look and ask the question, when was the system installed? Fire exits, are they blocked? Are they available? Are they clearly signed so that people who may be visitors into the building, can they clearly see their exit routes out? Have we identified assembly points for everybody? And lastly, have we maintained the premises from a fire safety point of view? And the simple word there is housekeeping. Have we made sure that the housekeeping throughout the building is suitable and sufficient? And have we logged all the details that we need into our fire safety logbook? This is a building. Uh, it's a, a large secondary school on the southeast coast. Um, the questions I asked there, where did it all go wrong? First question, was it sprinkled? Clearly not. Was it compartmented? Clearly not. These are issues that we need to look at. And while we're going around doing inspections, look at it from the point of view of compartmentation, of passive and active fire protection. In that case, the buildings will be safe for all to use. Thank you. Thanks for that, Gary. There was uh, a lot of uh, information to take in there. We've got three questions um, that I've just selected at random. We have had a lot of questions come in throughout that presentation. So um, we will um, produce a, a question and answer sheet um, at the end, which will be um, issued out. So apologies if I haven't got to your questions. Um, the first question in is why are sprinkler systems not routinely installed at build phase? Since we have a uh, communications issue at Gary's end, uh, would you like me to reply to that, Michelle? Absolutely, if you can, Alan, thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, the uh, question is, why are sprinkler systems not routinely installed at the build phase? And the fire suppression systems, which include sprinklers and water misting, are often not always, but often extracted from the project brief as a lean engineered solution, primarily to save costs. Okay, it's uh, as straightforward as that, is it, Alan? Thank you very much. Um, so where can members get further information regarding fire safety? Well, there are a number of very competent organizations who can provide guidance and signpost the best practice guides and the fire risk management group uh, being one of them. And I would recommend uh, members that are yet to join our group to do so. And finally, um, Gary mentioned about um, the fire authorities. Um, what defense can be offered to fire authorities who are prosecuting firms for failure to comply? Well, the due diligence defence, uh, where you've taken all reasonable steps, uh, is, is a, a good standby uh, because 
you've got to make sure first that your risk assessment reflects your business and that significant findings have been recorded with an action plan to resolve. And it's worth restating here, Michelle, that competency is the key. It's probably the theme that's going to run through this evening's presentation. Qualifications by themselves are not a guarantee of competence. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much, Alan, for uh, <coughs> stepping in uh, for, for Gary there. So with that, we're going to move on to our second presenter, uh, Michael Woods. Michael, would you like to uh, start your presentation, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Michael Woods, and I'm delighted to be here with you this evening to present on behalf of the Fire Risk Management Group. I, who am I? I retired as facilities officer from Dublin City University in 2019, where I had worked for 20 years. My career spanned 40 years plus in industry, and I've worked in many different environments, heavy engineering in the North Sea and the Middle East on oil platforms, to working in Intel, Xerox, and IBM. At DCU, I sat on the Health and Safety Consultation Group for nearly 20 years. I'm a chartered member of IOSH and a committee member on the Fire Risk Management section in Ireland, the Fire Risk Management Group and the Ireland branch. I studied at Trinity College Dublin and at Dublin City University. I'm going to talk about the definition of fire the law concerning staff responsibilities, preventative measures, risk perception and complacency, and fire safety, fire safety procedures for everyone. So what is fire? Fire is generated from a chemical reaction between oxygen in the atmosphere and some sort of fuel like wood or petrol. However, these products will not spontaneously combust just because they're surrounded by oxygen. Therefore, a combustion reaction must occur to heat the fuel to its ignition temperature. Wood usually ignites at about or between 250 to 300 degrees C and burns at about 600 degrees C, producing toxic fumes, smoke and soot. Fire has been with us for a very, very long time and we can go back to Neanderthal man, where records show fire was used for cooking, lighting, heating, and defense. The devastating effects of fire, harnessed in ways to inflict hell on enemies. We humans are very vulnerable when in close contact with fire. The dermis and lungs are very susceptible to damage from the byproducts of the combustion process. The Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 states, health and safety is everyone's responsibility. Everyone means everyone. The act protects everyone. It gives employers and workers duties at work. It gives inspectors powers to investigate accidents. It also includes imprisonment, fines and penalties for breaches of the act. The stick, if you like, to ensure that the rules are followed by everyone. Section seven is aimed at employees and states that every employee when at work must take reasonable care for their own health and safety, as well as the health and safety of others who may be affected by their acts or omissions at work. That's what you do and what you don't do. Therefore, I'm responsible for your health and safety when at work, and you're responsible for my health and safety at work. What the reasonable person would do. This duty is very important and must be communicated to all employees when attending safety meetings and training. Another very interesting quote under the 1974 Act is, so far as reasonably practical. 
The employer does not have to take measures to avoid or reduce risks if they are technically impossible or if the time or cost of those measures would be greatly disproportional to the risk. To me, that implies there are risks and hazards at work and they must be identified, written down and communicated to everybody in a manner and form they can understand. Employers are also, employees are also entitled to the provision of adequate fire safety measures on the premises to ensure, so far as reasonably practical, safety from harm caused by fire. Employees must cooperate with the employer so far as is necessary to allow them to comply with their fire safety responsibilities. This is where the focus becomes very much on the employee who must take reasonable steps to ensure that they are not in breach of their duty of care regarding their actions. Know your signs. Everybody arriving at a workplace will meet signage and the ones of importance regarding fire and emergency are in place for our benefit, such as the one shown here on the right hand side. Irrespective of whether you are a new employee or have been working in the industry for many years, employees must attend safety training courses at least once a year. Training materials and records should be updated to reflect any recent changes in the workplace. All these signs should be inspected and tested on regular preventative maintenance schedules. The next few slides will concentrate on fire risk perception and complacency during evacuation alarms. This slide represents a typical fire growth curve. But first, let's look at some drivers regarding fire risk perception where lay people or non-professionals may due to the lack of data and knowledge form predetermined outcomes which influence judgments in emergency situations. People also have life skills developed long before they enter the workplace from childhood to adulthood we also learn from our surroundings and peers. Some factors characterizing risk perception are, trust, do employees trust their employers? Human environments, the relationship with your fellow workers, the physical environment, is this a good place to work? SBS or sick building syndrome, safety climate, is there a safety culture in place? Building evacuation is seen as a psychological process involving both emotion and cognition. Therefore, it is not surprising that when the fire alarm is activated, we experience complacency in many environments. Looking at the fire growth curve, it represents temperature growth plot plotted against time. Note that the threat is generally is low and generally remains low first part of the curve. But depending on the fuel and the amount of oxygen, this variable can change. Smoke and other byproducts, such as carbon monoxide gas, also start to develop and increase over time. The sooner the alarm sounds, the sooner people move, the better the situation. Compartment fire development occurs in four stages. We have insipid, we have the growth of the fire, fully developed fire, and of course a decay. Flashover is not a stage of development, but simply a rapid trans transition between the growth and the fully developed stages. This means there is a sudden ignition of everything combustible in a contained area. Temperatures can rise to between 600 and 800 degrees C in just a few seconds. Humans are not likely to, su to survive in a compartment that has a flashover. over. 
looking at a timeline for evacuation, this is what should happen in an ideal situation following training. There are four distinct phases to evacuation that we need to understand and communicate to all employees. Phase one, the detection phase. This is from ignition to alert. There may be a time lag before detection or a human being detects the fire. Once detected in an automated system, the alarm will sound immediately. Without one, somebody observing the fire will need to give the alarm. Phase two, the pre-movement phase is from the alert when the fire has been detected, an alarm activated to evacuate, and the alarm is recognized until occupants start to move. This is a crucial phase because here complacency plays an important role. When people ask themselves whether they should evacuate or not, critical time may be lost. During the pre-movement phase, people tend to doubt if there is an alarm. They may look for the source of the fire or try to confirm there is an actual reason to evacuate. People may secure valuables, turn off equipment, or look for personal belongings they wish to take with them. People tend also to look for their colleagues or friends prior to moving. Travel time. This is the amount of time it takes for the individual to move through the structure to the exit. It is normally a predetermined, safe, well-lit, unobstructed route. Travel time may be influenced by blocked or obstructed pathways, poor lighting, or the fact that most direct ways out, the most direct way out of the building may not be the safest route due to hazardous areas, which should be avoided. Phase four is flow time, the time it takes to get through an exit door, the size of the exit, weather conditions, lighting and the calmness of evacuees all have an influence on the flow time. Therefore, it is essential when carrying out fire drills that everyone is instructed, that employees are instructed not to congregate at exit doors and to move directly to the designated assembly point. Here is an overlay of the previous two slides. Generally, all individuals in the building, including fire marshals, need to be out of the building and, a place, and in a place of safety within three minutes. The longer the evacuees delay or postpone their evacuation, the higher the risk of not escaping from the dangers of fire. Fire preparedness and the big event. On the left-hand side of the slide, the items that have been identified in the risk assessments and rehearsed in training will provide the basis for your employees to deal with the situation effectively. This was also discussed by Gary earlier in the presentation. When the activation takes place, the fire preparedness plan should be activated immediately and somebody must phone the fire brigade. The exception is where there is a direct link to the fire and rescue services. Depending on the severity, uh, the severity of the event, the fire damage and possible casualties, it will place major a major burden on the business. On the right-hand side here, coupled with the emergency plan, we have a business continuity plan. Sufficient to say that training employees will have a beneficial effect on the recovery process and a tried and tested BCP will cushion the path to recovery. This slide is an overview of an emergency management plan, which should take into account all employees and the risks and the hazards identified in the fire preparedness plan and other risk assessments. 
resources, buy-in from senior management and employees is a major driver to ensure the planning will work when your organization is faced with an emergency. All employees must be advised of the plan. And where a good safety culture is promoted, this should not be a major problem to implement effectively. Alan will discuss this further later in the presentation under management responsibilities. My final slides, basic procedures for everyone on hearing the fire alarm. First of all, alert everyone by shouting fire repeatedly to notify our colleagues nearby. Find and activate the nearest manual call point to ensure other billion occupants are alerted. Only attempt to extinguish the fire if you are trained. Don't put yourself in danger and keep a clear exit at your back. Don't waste time collecting your belongings. The clock is ticking. Close doors as you leave and never lock them. Evacuate the building by the nearest route and remember to follow the signs. Don't use the lift, even if it's a fireman's lift. Assemble at the designated fire assembly point away from the building and danger. Once outside the building, call the fire and rescue services. Stay put at the fire assembly point until you are accounted for and do not re-enter the building until the all clear is announced by a fire marshal, security, or a senior manager or a fire officer. Thank you very much for your time this evening. If there are any questions, I'll take them now. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's uh, an, another great uh, section there on um, responsibilities and uh, staff responsibilities. Um, again, lots and lots of questions coming in. Um, so I've just selected a few, um, if, uh, if I can. So Michael, uh, the first question is, why is my manager not responsible for my safety at work? Yeah, an interesting one, all right. Uh, management have a duty to employees. However, employees, as pointed out, also have a duty of care to themselves and to others, as outlined in the 74 Act. Therefore, you are responsible. Like the responsible person, you must take care when you're at work. Ensure you are fully up to speed with the latest safety notices that are posted in your place of work. Um, employees must be conscious that they have this duty when they're at work. Uh, lovely. Thanks, Michael. Um, so next question is, how best can employees promote a safe culture? So it's employees promoting a safe culture. OK. Um, as I sort of said, employees are at work and they have a duty of care. They get training and that should be at least once a year. Um, so really what they have to do is talk to talk and walk to walk. This is something uh, Intel were very famous for this. Uh, you got your training, but you had to put that training um, into action. And it was, you have to show by example and follow all your safety training. You need to be vigilant when you're at work and always report issues that you feel are unsafe so that other people uh, don't come across those, say, trip hazards or faulty, uh, what would I say, uh, escape doors, push bars. We've all had the situations uh, probably not so much now, but uh, where people were using escape routes, push the bar out, go out and have a nice cigarette outside. Um, those doors are not intended for that purpose. So you report things like that. Um, that's, that's the best way to promote a safety culture is to keep on top of it. Thanks, Michael. Um, so you mentioned about fire drills um, throughout your presentation. Why are dates and times of fire drills uh, notified to employees? Yeah, um, 
not all organizations um, really can afford to shut down to accommodate a fire drill just randomly. Uh, the cost and loss of time in some of these industries pro prohibit the way uh, that these type of drills uh, can be carried out. However, all drills do provide management data uh, and provide employees with the opportunity to familiarize themselves with building activation plans. So the, 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 the big point there is cost and loss of time in certain industries and under the reasonably practicable. Um, that's why they have to notify people. You just can't shut down a hospital uh, or maybe a chemical process or a simple thing like a bakery. Once there's product in the line, um, it, it's just disastrous and it doesn't really, um, it, it, you know, you can do the evacuation drill at some other time uh, without that loss. And finally, um, just for yourself, Michael, if um, if my colleague refuses to evacuate um, or sorry, vacate um, the premises when the alarm activates, am I responsible for their safety? Yeah, that's an interesting one. All right. Uh, your immediate response to a fire alarm activation is to ensure your own safety. However, you should always encourage your colleagues to respond without delay. The fire warden sweeping the building will take care of stragglers. Where appropriate, a verbal and possibly a written disciplinary warning in line with the employment contractual arrangements may be imposed. So if you're one of these organizations um, where possibly you get your verbal warning, a written warning, maybe after that you won't have a job so it is important that people evacuate when the alarm goes off. And all that your colleague can do is encourage you to do that. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you thank for you. your uh, presentation there. So um, finally, I'm going to ask uh, Alan Shaw to uh, come back to our screens, if I may, um, for Alan's um, presentation, the final presentation of the evening. Alan, if I could ask you to start sharing your um, screen, that would be great. Thank you. Can you see that now, Michelle? We can. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. So in continuation of our emergency preparedness, I'd like to uh, start my presentation on management responsibilities. Uh, that's me once again. So management responsibilities, what am I going to talk about? The law concerning management responsibilities, uh, this includes fire safety strategy as previously mentioned. Uh, fire risk assessment, it comes before everything. If you haven't done your fire risk assessment, then you and your employees and your contractors and your visitors are vulnerable. Information, instruction, training and supervision. Protecting means of escape, emergency lighting, and finally, fire doors and fire safety records. So the Health and Safety at Work Etc. Act 1974, it became law in April 1975, that's 46 odd years ago. Sections two and three apply. Section two, general duties of employers to employees to see the provision of information, instruction, training and supervision that I've just mentioned. And 2D, the means of access and egress that are safe, so far as is reasonably practicable, that phrase again. And then section three, duties of employers to others than employees, your neighbors, your visitors, your contractors. Your contractors might not be employed by you, they're employed by a, another company. And inspectors, auditors, government officials, the emergency services, we have a duty to those persons. Now, the management regulations, as amended in 2003, built upon the Health and Safety at Work Act. Regulation 3, risk assessment, is central to the management regulations. 
and Regulation 8 uh, Procedures for Serious and Imminent Danger. I myself am involved with a water company right now uh, and desire hazardous areas are top of our agenda. Uh, the dangerous substances and explosive atmospheres regulations uh, are very appropriate in a water processing uh, circumstance. So there's a higher fire risk there and serious and imminent danger needs to be thought about in your emergency plan. The Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005, aka the FSO, Risk assessment by a competent person. Now, this is a book of judgment that's used by the regulatory authorities, but they actually prosecute you if it's the health and safety executive under the Health and Safety at Work Act, section two generally, but it can be section three and other sections. So article nine of the FSO, risk assessment by a competent person is key. Article 13C, arrange necessary contact with the fire and rescue services. We've already spoken about that, and that is key. Let them know where you are. The what three words address of your main entrance is something that I'm getting on my client's checklist so that the brigade know exactly where they should go to. Article 21, training on induction, on new risks, on transfer or promotion. And Article 34, the onus is placed upon what is practicable or reasonably practicable. So let's look at that uh, phrase one last time. What is, so far as is reasonably practicable? Well, there is a legal definition for that, or rather it's a definition that has been uh, historically used in the court of law, and that is it's reasonable to the man on the Clapham omnibus. But we're not talking about a modern Boris bus here. This is the Clapham omnibus. It says Clapham on the side. It's at Beamish Museum. It was horse-drawn, but it means that the everyday person, you or I, would use the Clapham omnibus if we happen to be in Clapham. And practicable means that if it can be done, then do it. Simple. So we come to fire risk assessment. It underpins everything that we do. How old is your fire risk assessment? Go and look. Is it more than two years old? Does it need review? Is it still relevant? Has it been overtaken by events? Is it going to save you in a court of law? The competent person. I think we've established now that competency is training, experience, knowledge, and information, needs to carry out the fire risk assessment. Was the person that carried out your fire risk assessment competent? The fire risk assessment needs to be made shortly after changes to the building or occupancy of the premises, but not before. We need to know how you're going to use the building. So perhaps a month after you've occupied it and you're comfortable with using the building, invite us in to do a fire risk assessment because that will be the best indication of what you need to be thinking about. And have it reviewed if you've got significant changes to occupancy of the premises. We've now employed 100 more people than we had before. The use of the premises, I've said now we're smelting lead, but let's look at how we're using it now. Management of the premises could change. The, the landlord's management company might change and they might have a different way of doing things. We have to work closely with that regime with other users of that building. And the fire safety procedures on the premises, if they're ours, much easier. If we're sharing them, not so. And then new fire safety legislation, as we talked about the fire bill already. So information, instruction, training and supervision. Fire safety information would typically be if staff and contractors and visitors were briefed prior to entry into the building in the reception lobby, 
where the sign-in book is, and your signature should be demonstrable in law that you have read and understood the safety information that has been given to you. That might be quite simple in a very small building and a simple office accommodation. It might be more complex in other circumstances. Those books should be kept for up to five years in case of civil or criminal litigation. Information will include sound of the fire alarm, evacuation procedure, means of escape, names and photographs of fire marshals, and location of the fire assembly point, as we've already told you. And supervision here, not often that we supervise our operations, but when we have permit to work required, and hot works in particular, they need to be supervised. So the person that is issuing the permit to work and then canceling it when the job is finished needs to know about holdover times, that it's going to be an hour minimum before the contractor should leave. And they need to be a competent supervisor so that we have a safe system of work. Now let's have a look at the plan of our escape routes. Ideally, a plan, a simple one like this one here, could appear on the information board at reception so that you know, or you will know, where your escape routes are. And here this plan has shown manual call points as well. Fire exits should be clearly signposted, emergency lighting en route, and a minimum of 800 millimeters gap to be kept clear in corridors at all times, inside and outside of the building. In particular, I look outside the building at the fire exit to see whether or not that is clear, whether we've got dangerous substances or combustible materials stored within five meters of the building, and in particular, whether or not we've got a three meter clearance at least between openable windows on the ground floor and combustible materials outside, because that's going to limit fire spread if we can control that. And we have management, uh, we have manual call points on changes of direction or elevation, typically on uh, corners of, of the building as shown here, but also on stair landings. Adequate fire doors to protect escape route, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Let's look at emergency lighting now. Now, many of you will know what I mean when I use the term non-maintained. It doesn't mean that you're not maintaining them. Uh, non-maintained means that the emergency light is not on. It won't come on unless or until the fire intensity is such that the electrical supply to that emergency light is irreparably damaged. And then the batteries within that system should kick in and the light should come on. I think there's too much uh, confidence or expectation placed on non-maintained lighting that that gives us what we need. What we need is a corridor that's already well lit with ordinary light bulbs, because as I said before, the non-maintained lights might not come on. The maintained lights are on all the time. So let's have a look at some of them. Here we have a non-maintained system. Typically, it's got a green light to show you that the battery is charging. And we've got confidence because we've tested them and we've inspected them. And once a year, we've run them on battery for up to three hours so that we know that the batteries are still doing their job and that the fire and emergency rescue services can work in the building if necessary for up to three hours. Another non-maintained unit, but this one has a red light on it, as you can see. So why the red light? Well, I want you to think about them not as emergency lights now, but as vacuum cleaners. The one on the left with the green light is a Hoover. The one on the right with a, with a red light is a Dyson. They're both vacuum cleaners. They both do an equal job. They're both non-maintained and emergency lights. It just happens that one of them has a red light means that it's working and the batteries are charging. A maintained system would be on all the time. And this one is excellent because as you can see, the light is shining onto an escaping person sign en route to a fire escape or a, a, a fire exit. 
Fardos and compartmentation now. The first I'm going to talk about are FD6DS. That's a long way of saying a one hour's fire protection. They're usually of steel or solid hardwood. And the way to tell, because you can't always tell, me included, looking at that door, is that the depth of the door on an FD60 is 54 millimeters. Now, before you can put in an FD60 door, you need to assure yourself that the walls that are surrounding it and supporting it are twice, give twice the protection. So for a one hour door, you need a two hour wall so that you can maintain that safe compartmentation. Other things on the FD60 is no cracks or holes, must fit firmly, glazing to have a pyro or a CE mark, and smoke seals and intumescent strips to keep out the fire. Now, the simpler ones, which are the ones that we're more familiar with because we see them all the time, and this one was taken inside uh, an apartment building, uh, will be an FD30. That gives half an hour protection, but again, the glazing and the wall behind it need to offer twice that. So that needs to be a one hour protection to support an FD30 door. And that has a smaller depth of door, that's 45 millimeters. So if you think about it, it's easy to remember. The one hour door, 54 millimeters, depth of door, the 30 minute door, 45. So 54, 45, remember that and you will determine what the door is. Same again, but smoke seals as a minimum, please. Okay, this final slide is gonna be talking about scheduled planned preventive maintenance. And I'm going to talk about that while you jot things down if you don't already know. These are the records that I would be checking on when I do a fire risk assessment and the lack of them or the positive response and the availability on site is going to tell me whether or not I have got confidence in the management of those premises. We've got a fire alarm, let's test it once a week. Why? So that people know what it sounds like. Often you've got a security alarm has a different semitone, traces of 40 towers there, for those of you who can remember. We need to know what the fire alarm sounds like. The fire detection centers, six monthly inspections in large buildings, such as I'm used to doing with um, the London premises that I check, then quarterly inspections more often, and then annually, to have a testing certificate for the entire system and checked at the far panel. Emergency lighting, I've mentioned the three hour battery test. There's also a requirement after six months to do a one hour test. Often that's omitted. Uh, I'm quite easy going on that as long as the three hour battery test is, is done. And fixed electrical testing, five year certificate is a must annual gas safety inspection certificate. Uh, I'd like to see that as well. Fire marshal or fire warden training. Let's have it done and let's have it on a three yearly recurrent basis. There are not enough fire marshals. Do you have one in your building? Ask that question. We, we should have photographs of the fire marshals and their names and their contact numbers up on the walls on every floor and by their desk in good companies, they have a sign above the desk with fire marshal and they have uh, tabards and high vids in order to say fire marshals in the event of a fire evacuation. And let's have an annual fire drill recorded at least once a year. If it's a large building, we should be doing it more often, taking the point that Michael made that we can't invite everybody to do that. Where we have personal emergency escape plans or personal emergency evacuation plans, I should say, for individuals, they do not need to take part themselves, but they can nominate somebody to represent them. And where we have refuges, they need to be in a secure area with communications. That's me done. Do, thank you very much for your time this evening. And are there any more questions, please?
Thanks, Alan. That's, uh, again, third and final presentation, very informative with uh, lots to, to take away and for us to consider. Um, again, um, so many questions have come in um, throughout all three presentations. What we will do is um, we're going to grab all the questions that have come in throughout the three presentations and we will produce a question and answer sheet that can and will be issued out to, to everybody that's uh, attended tonight. Um, but just to finish off, Alan, just two questions if I can. Um, you spoke heavily around fire risk assessment. I mean, you know, that everybody knows is very important. So what makes a fire risk assessment different from a health and safety risk assessment? Well, I, I'm often asked this uh, question, Michelle, and uh, I've got a pre-prepared answer in as much as it's something that I'm always having discussions with my clients, particularly at senior management level. Uh, usually I find at uh, a functional level where I've got facilities management and a facilities manager, they fully understand the principle and they understand the process because they assist in it most of the time. But directors and senior managers and duty holders are often very pressed for time and they have other people to worry about. So I read, read them uh, a lecture, if you like, but very, very simply in broad uh, brushstrokes and capital letters. But the basic principles remain the same. A fire risk assessment identifies the hazard, uh, who may uh, be uh, caused harm by what, um, and a hazard is something that's harm or loss. And if you're thinking about a business risk register and a business risk strategy, then you're going to be interested as an organization about loss to the asset, loss to the individual, and the cost of that to your business, as well as the overarching importance of life safety. Uh, identify who may be exposed to it, how many uh, persons may be exposed, and how frequently and for how long. So that exposure is part of the risk process. And to evaluate the likelihood, uh, that's the likelihood in your experience. What do your records tell you? And what does your business uh, area, arena, tell you about likely uh, occurrences within the sort of work that you do? And review it and update. And re we recommend annually uh, more frequently if it's a high risk uh, area is identified. Sometimes if we've not had a satisfactory outcome with hazards that have been identified on a particular site, I might stipulate a review within three to six months at senior level and perhaps call us back to have another look uh, and make further recommendations. So is good compartmentation in place is it the moe the means of escape is that is that evident can you see it uh, do we have adequate signage uh, is a suitable and sufficient ordinary lighting which i bang on about as well as good emergency lighting fire doors all the things that we've spoken about michelle is is there a fire alarm uh, installed is it maintained and, and tested is it appropriate as uh, Michael had uh, indicated. Do we have fire marshals? Are they trained? Do we have fire safety training for employees? And I myself am engaged with a water company looking at that across the board. We're examining e-learning, for instance, and we're examining tutored uh, online training. And we make recommendations for additional mitigations, having looked at the existing controls in place with the timescales for implication. Uh, for implementation. Does that answer your question? That's lovely. Thanks, Alan. Um, and just uh, finally, um, what evidence um, or sorry, what can evidence um, good fire safety management? OK, uh, it's almost easiest to answer that because it's the supporting uh, opposite of what I've just said. Uh, if we got negative up top with the fire risk assessment, um, I find that if I get a positive response from staff uh, when they're questioned, uh, that it uh, indicates that they have themselves confident in the management and the arrangements on the present premises. And they soon tell me if they don't and what they think is wrong, that they've received adequate training so they understand what needs to be done. 
uh, that the fire information is given to them. In information is vital in uh, many areas and it's basic in office areas. You just need a basic information of what to do in the event of a fire. Fire action notices, are they posted by the manual call points, for instance? A fire alarm panel, is it accessible? Does it have a zone chart uh, on it? Uh, portable fire extinguishers, are they in their correct location? I very often find them propping open doors. I very often find that fire doors are wedged open. So that's something that would uh, evidence good uh, management if that is not the case. Um, corridors of fire exit need to be enough, suitable and sufficient, in other words. They need to remain unobstructed at all times. How do we do that? Management inspections will ensure by doing the walk the walk, talk the talk, that that is the case. Fire safety notices are posted in high risk areas in particular, and no smoking signs. And is there a smoking area that itself is signposted? And is the fire assembly point accessible? And if there are more than one, which one do you go to? Storage cupboards, high risk areas, are they locked uh, against unauthorized access? And do staff when interviewed understand their action, both on alarm and action in the event of a fire? And finally, the managers interviewed, if, have they got confidence in their superiors and more importantly, in their staff? And if not, what are they gonna be doing about it? So those are the sort of questions that I ask almost on a daily basis. Thanks very much, Alan. You're very welcome. So thank, thank you. you to our three presenters tonight. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand back to Neil Vincer, the chair of the Fire Risk Management Group. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and thank you to the three presenters for the work and things they have done tonight. Um, hopefully you'll now see actually where in my introduction, I mentioned the fact that we will be talking at different levels. Uh, we will be talking to the people who are coming first into the OSH profession or fire profession. And indeed those who are more experienced where you've been doing things and we tried to remind you. Judging by the numbers, um, of questions and, uh, of, that I've noted have actually come in after clearly we couldn't handle them all here tonight, but we will do uh, and we will get back to you with the answers um, to your questions. But it goes to show actually that we've asked or got you to ask an awful lot of questions about what's been said. Um, and that means actually we've got you thinking and that's the whole idea about this evening's event was to get you thinking about emergency preparedness and I like to think actually that we've managed to achieve that through the three presentations. So it falls to me actually to thank Alan Dunn and the East Midlands branch team um, for actually inviting the virus management group to work with them tonight. Um, it also go back to the presenters, the three presenters and the backup team from the, from the FRMG who, who've actually supported them as well. Thanks to Ben, uh, Ben Pollard in, in IOSH, who has been behind the scenes. You've heard him a couple of times, um, but uh, basically he's ensured that we've proceeded and, and managed to, to put this event together tonight. And a big, big final thank you to you, the attendees, because without you, um, an event is not really put in on. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's something which it's gives us a pleasure to know that in fact there's so many people out there who've actually, and hopefully you've all taken something away with you, whether it's one point or whether it's a, a question that you're gonna take away, at least it means you've showed something as you've got out of this evening. So having said that, I say thank you and I hopefully I haven't missed anybody here and certainly to Michelle, et cetera, for, for giving the questions and things tonight. But I'd like to hand you over to Alan Dunn, who's going to finalize and give some final notices um, and comments uh, from his perspective. So thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, as chair of the, of the fire group there. And thank you to the old speakers. And again, I echo the thanks for Ben and the backup teams there, including Michelle with the question and answers. So what I would just like to say is, I think you've all got something from the three presentations that would, uh, fill in your CPD in lots of different areas. So please use that, it'd be great to see that. So you're taking something back to your workplace also. 
And um, just as a quick reminder, what I would like to say is, please, the East Midlands branch holds its AGM 10th of May at half past six, 18.30 hours. That's our very next meeting. And then we've got another interesting talk on loan working, which again covers so many of us in different areas and different sectors of the workplaces. So that is on the 20th of May, and that is at 1900 hours, seven o'clock p.m. So once again, thank you for all attending. Really appreciate the attendance, which was 363, I think, round about a peak. So thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Thank you.